Hey guys, how's it going? So in the last tutorial on Vue.ai, which is a GUI of Quantum Espresso, we covered a lot of stuff like um, performing geometrical manipulations, like creating a vacancy or introducing an impurity or even creating a supercell or a super slab using the modeling feature of this program. So in this tutorial, what we'll be doing is we'll be covering how to perform an SCF calculation. So this is the first tutorial in which we'll be performing any particular kind of calculation. So in order to perform an SCF calculation, um, we need some systems. So for this tutorial, what I'll do is we'll be using um, a silicon uh, crystal lattice. So head over to the My Projects tab in the BRI home folder or home tab and then head over to the examples and then you can open the SIF folder and then select either of these silicon SIF files so just go ahead and open one of these so now in the geometry tab of this uh, you know software what you can see is you can see all the geometrical aspects of this system like it has uh, you know cubic Bravais lattice and then we have the lattice parameter and then we have the positions of the atoms and then we can choose the pseudo potential in this particular tutorial, um, we will be using the um, ultra soft zero potential that is this one. So it has nonlinear core correction that is you can see it right here. So NL also denotes that. Then PB denotes that it is a GGA uh, kind of exchange correlational functional. And then RKGUS. So here US means the ultra soft zero potential. Right. So we will be using this particular zero potential. And we already know that the suggested cutoff for wave function is 43 read bugs for this particular zero potential so just go ahead and double click on it to select it now everything in the geometry tabs looks all right so just go ahead and click on the scf tab to perform an scf calculation now here are a number of you know um, settings that you might want to um, customize or you know change according to your needs so we'll be going uh, one by one uh, through all of these so first of all we have the restart mode so this one is used in case you know if you don't want to uh, you know start your calculations from scratch and you have already you know performed some calculations then you can have the restart mode as yes so that it you know picks up the temporary files that were or the you know all other kinds of uh, files that were created in the previous run so it will use that instead of you know uh, calculating everything from scratch so if you have it at on yes mode then what you will notice in the input file is that you will see that the restart mode parameter of the quantum espresso is set to restart however if you change it to no and reload the input file then you will see that the restart mode is basically from scratch so the default value even if you don't uh, you know provide this parameter then it is from scratch so since this is the first calculation so restart mode set to yes doesn't make any sense so we'll just keep it out on scratch and it is also useful like sometimes if you're performing lengthy calculations then if you properly you know um, terminate your calculations then you can uh, later on start the or resume the calculations by setting the restart mode to yes then we have the maximum time so this sets the you know it is pretty much self-explanatory that it sets the maximum time that your calculation is going to run or is going to be allowed to run so uh, for now it is set to 24 hours in uh, so you can see this number this corresponds to 24 hours I guess in seconds however you can change it to whatever you want so that's that and then uh, you have two options that is whether you want to calculate the force and stress or not so if you set these to yes then you will notice that the input file you know would have these two more parameters that's it, uh, that is the quantum espresso software will now be calculating the force as well as the stress however if you set it to no then these two will become false and the default value is again false then we have another important part that is the plane waves so here what we have is we can set the cutoff for the wave function as well as the charge density so um, as we already know that we saw from the pseudo potential file here that the suggested um, cutoff for the wave function was 43 Rittbergs so we should probably you know change that in our case to 43 Rittbergs however there is a method to calculate or you know find out whatever your uh, whatever is the uh, optimum cutoff for the wave function so that method is called the you know method of conver convergence I guess so what you do is you calculate the uh, 
you know energies at different kind of uh, energies that is like at 10 Rydberg, 15 Rydberg, 20 Rydberg and so on. So you keep on doing that and then you see how the energy you know is changing. So if the energy is, does, is not changing by much then you can uh, you know find out the cutoff wave function uh, in that process. However now coming to the cutoff for charge now by default the quantum espresso takes the charge cutoff as basically four times the that of the cutoff for the wave function for a normal potential. Now since we are using an ultra soft potential it is suggested that um, in case of ultra so soft poten pseudo potentials what we need is we need uh, the cutoff charge as about 8 to 12 times the cutoff for wave functions. So let's go ahead and set it to like um, 10 times so 430 Rydberg. So just hit enter and then you can see that the uh, uh, the input file would now have these changes. So the cutoff for the wave function is 43 Rydbergs while the cutoff for the charge density is basically 40, 430 Rydbergs. So you can set these parameters. Then we have the you know K point grid here. So again uh, you know there is a method to find out the optimum K point grid and that is again the method of con convergence that is you find out the energies at or basically what you do is you run an SCF calculation at different number of K points like um, we will run them for 8 or 2 to 2 or 4 4 4 number and then we will you know notice that uh, for what number the energy starts changing by much and then we will you know call that our optimum or convergent k point grid so for this tutorial let's just assume and you know okay now let me just use for a four cross four cross four grid because this would be pretty small and faster to calculate so uh, for this tutorial we'll be using a four by four by four grid however you can increase it to whatever you want then coming to the occupations part now here we have two options that is smearing and fix now quantum espresso recommends that for semiconductors or insulators we use the fixed part if you want to get the you know the band gap uh, in the scf calculation however for metals you can just use smearing here and then if you are using occupations as smearing then you have to provide what kind of smearing then you can choose any of these whichever you prefer and then you can set the smearing width as well in different units and then you will see all these changes being reflected in the input file like the occupation smearing and all that stuff now um, for this tutorial let me just go ahead and change it to fixed so that we calculate the you know um, so that since we are calculating this for an insulator or a semiconductor and then what we are also going to do is we are going to add one more parameter that is called NBND that is number of bands and we will set that to um, Okay, so to find out the value, let me just go here and we will see that the number of bands should be 32. So let me just go ahead and add that parameter and band equal to 32 and click here so that it saves that. Now what this uh, you know is going to do is it will help me to find out the uh, band gap. So if we have the occupations as fixed, then quantum espresso will return the you know energy of the highest occupied level now if i provide more number of bands then what it will do is it will calculate the energies of uh, you know electrons in the conduction band as well and then it will provide me two energies that is the highest occupied level and the lowest unoccupied level so and that way if we provide a high number of bands we will be able to get the um, the band gap from the scf calculation itself so that is why we are doing that and then uh, coming back to the you know settings in the SCF tab so we have covered all these standard settings then coming to the electronic optimization now here what you have is you have the option to set the maximum number of steps so when an SCF calculation is run basically what it does is it performs various uh, number of iterations so here you can set that what is the maximum number of iterations that you want uh, in case your calculations are not converging so default value is 100 but here we have set it to 201 so I mean the quantum espresso default is 100 however the BURI default is 200 as you can see right here so you can change that accordingly however usually um, systems uh, usually converge with around like 10 to 30 iterations at max 
and then we have the threshold for the you know convergence so basically uh, the quantum espresso software calculates the energy at each iteration and the threshold value tells you or the quantum espresso that uh, when to you know stop the iterations that is if the energies are not changing by more than 10 to the power minus 6 Rydbergs then it will you know consider the calculation as converged so you can change that according to your needs currently it is set to 10 to the power minus 6 Rydbergs which is pretty you know good enough and then we have the wave function option so here you can you know set whether you want to have the initial guess as purely at atomic or you want it to be atomic plus random and then there is a random option and then you have a file option so you can provide a file containing this information so let's just you know stick to the default atomic plus random and then you have the option to choose the diagonalization algorithm that will be implemented so here are the three choices but we'll just stick to the default and then we have the option to set the charge density whether you want it to be uh, you know atomic or file so we'll again we'll just stick to the default atomic value and in case you are uh, you know setting it to file then you will need to provide um, the address to the temporary directory which is storing all this stuff so when uh, you know quantum espresso performs the calculation it stores a bunch of stuff stuff in a temporary directory so if you you know uh, you know set it to file then you will need to give it the information about that uh, you know file that is where it is stored and that would be given using the you know uh, an option called out directory and and don't worry about it i'll probably cover that in a future tutorial but uh, for this tutorial we'll just stick to admin and then we have the mixing method and then we have the you know the mixing beta value that is how much mixing you want to be done so uh, basically what it is is that after each scf calculation it just uses you know some part of that electron density and some part of the new electron density and so using this mixing beta option which is currently set set 2.7 you provide the information like how much mixing of the new and old electron densities you want to be there and all that stuff and by the way starting wfc is set to atomic plus random from here and then the starting potential is set to atomic from here so you can see any changes you make here in this m percent electrons name list so this is the electrons name list and every any change you make in this you know electronic optimization um, setting then they will show up here and then coming to the magnetization and gga plus u now sometimes what you have is you have a magnetic system like fe or you know nickel or any other like that then you have the option to perform spin polarized calculations so to perform spin polarized calculations just set it to um, collinear and then when you re reload this then you will notice an option called n spin is equal to 2 up here so n spin equal to 1 basically means non spin polarized calculations and 2 for spin polarized calculations and then you have the uh, you know what you need to do is you need to prof uh, provide the number of electrons uh, you know in the up spin configuration or the number of electrons in the down spin configuration now let's say if we were you know performing this calculation for iron then what we will do is we will probably have all the electrons in the up spin configuration so if you want all the electrons to be in the up spin configuration then you give it one and if you want all the electrons to be in the down spin, spin configuration then you give the parameter minus one and uh, anything like in decimals basically just means if it is positive it means that 50 percent of the electrons are in the up spin configuration and 50 and uh, if you give minus 0.5 then it means like minus uh, i mean 50 percent of the electrons have down spins so that is how you use the spin polarized calculations to evaluate the like things like magnetic moments or maybe you know density of states which are spin polarized and all that and then you have another thing called the fi uh, fixing of magnetization so sometimes what you want to do is you want to provide an external magnetic field so in order to simulate that what you can do is you can provide a total magnetic field which and you can give the value in the Bohr magneton in along the z-axis here and if you perform non-collinear calculations then you can you know fix the magnetic field in all the three directions and you can even provide the starting magnetizations in all the three directions now coming back to the collinear magnetization so any changes you make here they come into the category of starting magnetization so that is the quantum espresso input parameter 
and you can find more about that in the input file help of the quantum espresso so that's all however since uh, silicon is obviously non-magnetic so let's just stick to non-polarized calculations however if you even if you are performing spin polarized calculations using the collinear tab and even if you provide some starting magnetization you don't need to worry because the system will automatically after all these iterations they, it will all automatically be in a non-magnetized state so that's how you will know if your system uh, is you know modeled or you know is predicted to be magnetized or non-magnetized using DFT. So that's all in the magnetization tab. Now coming to the GGA plus U. So typically what it was seen was that the conventional DFT methods like GGA were you know underestimating the band gaps and that was because the DFT was you know over delocalizing the uh, the electronic orbitals or the elect I mean the electronic states I guess. So GGA, conventional GGA over delocalizes these states. However, there is a setting called the Hubbard correction. So you can use Hubbard correction to, you know, what it does is basically it localizes the atomic, I mean the electronic states. And what it does is uh, it, you know, brings the valence uh, band states uh, a little further apart from the conduction band and hence increasing the band gap. So it solves the problem of underestimation for most of the systems. However, it's still not perfect. And so what, so basically to implement such a Hubbard correction, what you do is you select yes. And then you will notice that there will be a parameter called LDA plus U set to true. So basically now you are performing a DFT plus U calculation. And then you can set the Hubbard parameter as whatever you want. So um, you can set it to like zero, um, like five electron volts or something like that. However, for this particular tutorial, we just stick, we'll just be sticking to uh, a conventional DFT calculation. So that's all the settings in the STF, you know, tab of the uh, BRI software. And then I already covered the K points. That is the you know, it basically specifies the monk hot back grid i mean i'm not sure how to perform uh, you know pronounce that but so monk host back grid or something like that so it basically gives the size of that so currently we are using a four by four by four k point grid and these three numbers basically tell the offset of these grids so basically how the grid is displayed so currently we are using a zero offset however you can change that according to your needs and K point automatic basically means and uh, this you know particular setting automatic basically means that we are using a monk host pack grid however if you are using or you know calculating only a uh, you know you are performing only a gamma point calculation then you can set it to gamma as well so you'll just change it to gamma and then I don't think you'll be needing to provide these however if you are you know like um, changing it to crystal B or two pi by A kind of things, then you can even provide the K point path, like along which symmetry points you want this calculation to run. However, it is a good idea to just, you know, uh, perform an automatic kind of calculation for the SCF and then give a, you know, high symmetry path for the band structure calculations. But for SCF and uh, density of states, I usually, you know, provide a monk spec grid. And then we have all these geometric properties that we already covered in the last tutorial. So we have probably covered all these stuff that is here. So I guess now we are ready to run our calculation. So just go ahead and click on here and then select run. Now it will prompt you to save your project. So just go ahead and do that first. So silicon um, SEF test. All right, then hit enter. And then what it will tell you is it will ask you that how many, you know, processes you want this to be running on and then how many threads you want it to be running. So I have set both of these to four. However, just, you know, increasing this number doesn't mean that your calculation will, you know, scale infinitely faster. It depends on the uh, configuration of your PC. That is how many cores and uh, threads your processor has. So, and then you have the host name, which is just local host currently and then you have the job type so we are running the SCF calculation for now so it is set to SCF and then just go ahead and hit enter or OK and then coming back you know to our SCF test then you if you click here and click on result then you will notice that there will be two files so in basically tells you the how the input file looks 
and the log.scf basically shows you the uh, you know the output file of the SCF calculation so as you can see that uh, it tells you that program BWSCF was started on 1st Jan at this time and all that stuff and how many processes was it launched on like it was launched on 16 processors like 4 processors and 4 threads per process so that makes it 16 and then you know here you have the first iteration going on so it tells you that ecurd is set to this and we have this mixing beta value and it is currently performing the davidson diagonalization now if you reload it then you can see that how many more iterations have been performed since then and you can see that currently we are on fifth iteration now coming back and you now you'll notice that there's another file called scf.in so it is a cool little graphical uh, plot that shows you how the SCF or the total energies are converging in this SCF calculation. So you, as you can see that after five iterations, we have, uh, you know, the SCF has converged. So coming back to the output file. Now here you can notice that since we set the force and stress calculation to true, so we will have, you know, those things calculated here or okay i think that we turn them off okay so we turn the force and stress calculations off by the way however if they were true then we would have them being shown in the last however currently you have the total energy and the all the contributions to that from here and then the important thing is the highest occupied and the lowest unoccupied level so this will give you the band gap now currently you can see that it is something around 0.69 or something so which is a pretty underestimation of the silicon band gap, which is known to be like 1.1 electron volts. So um, that is how you perform an SCF calculation and um, that's it, I guess. So at each iteration, you can see that how is the you know energy changing. So at the first iteration, we had um, the energy to be minus 81.746. Then at the second iteration, it was minus 81.755. So there was a change of like 0 0.008 in these two energies. Then in the fourth iteration, we had the energy as minus 81.7557. So you can see that at this step, we had an estimated SCF accuracy of less than 0 0.00000106. So that's like five decimal places. And then finally, after five iterations, we achieved our SCF accuracy or converge convergence threshold that is 10 to the one minus six. So that's it. Sorry for this video being too long. Hope you guys enjoyed it and learned something from it. And in case you did, then don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to my channel for more videos like this. Thanks for watching and have a great day.